The first lesson is recorded in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. Jeremiah was known as the weeping or the lamenting prophet. He lived in the city of Jerusalem uh, when it was overrun by the Babylonians around uh, 600 B.C. And uh, the people did not like to hear his message that they needed to repent of their sin and turn back to the Lord for forgiveness. Uh, They wanted to put him to death. Uh, One time they threw him into a deep well where uh, he was left to die, but somebody uh, was able to rescue him uh, from that well. This man uh, knew that uh, God was going to punish Israel because they had forsaken him, but he also promised that the Lord, after 70 years in the Babylonian captivity, would return his people to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and to begin worship again. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. The second lesson is recorded in St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 3, verses 19 through 28. These uh, words also serve as our sermon text. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law, Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. The verse of the day is printed on the top of page 9. Alleluia. If you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel is recorded in John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. Glory to, you, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Here ends the gospel reading.
This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Amen. Last Thursday, October 31st, was the 502nd anniversary of the Lutheran Reformation. It's pretty fascinating to see how God worked through a humble man, a monk by the name of Martin Luther. And the reason I say that is because Martin Luther's life, maybe the first 25 years, were pretty difficult. He was constantly wrestling with the idea that he was not good enough. He was raised in a very strict Roman Catholic home. His father, Hans Luther, was a minor. And Hans had a, a great plans for his son, wanted him to become an attorney, sent him to the University of Erfurt, one of the best colleges and universities available. One day, while Martin Luther was traveling from home back to school, there was a terrible lightning storm that struck a tree right by him, threw him to the ground. He thought he was going to die. He was so frightened. And he cried out to St. Anne that if God would save his life and preserve him, that he would become a monk in the Roman Catholic Church. Well, he kept his word. And we see that God worked uh, wonderful things through that decision, even though he may have made that decision for the wrong reason. Well, when the word got back to his father, Hans, that uh, he was not going to be an attorney, but now was changing his major and was going to become a monk in uh, the Augustinian monastery, his father went ballistic. And he let Luther know that he wasn't good enough in his eyes as his father. And this was something that Luther wrestled with most of his life. It's kind of fascinating. I don't know if you've ever wrestled with thoughts like that about yourself, that you're just not good enough. Maybe you've always come in second place, would like to come in first place sometime. It's fascinating how we speak to ourselves. And you know that self-talk is learned in the home at a very early age. How our parents spoke to us, how they treated us, is what we believed we were. If you came from a very critical home where your parents spoke to you only when you did something wrong, you probably grew up thinking that you were kind of bad, not quite good enough. That was the kind of home that I grew up in. It was a a critical home. My father was a pastor. But it was kind of an interesting thing. I didn't realize that, of course, growing up. So always kind of wrestled with not being good enough. These are things that we wrestle with because we have sinful and imperfect natures. And uh, Satan especially would like us to think that we're worthless, no good, and that nobody really should love us or care for us or want to be with us or spend time with us. Luther wrestled with these thoughts and the Roman Catholic Church in his day uh, really heaped more of that thinking on him. And he found that out as an Augustinian monk. Because there was no one who worked harder and tried harder to follow all the rules and regulations that the uh, Augustinians had placed on him now as a monk. In fact, uh, we're told that uh, he would pray every night, deep into the night, fall asleep. Sometimes he would beat himself trying to drive out those feelings of not being good enough trying to be right with God. The first Mass that he spoke, he was scared to death that God was going to appear and he thought he was going to die. Still wrestling with not good enough. It took quite a while, actually, for him to work through these thoughts and these ideas about himself and his life. He wasn't free from them until the Lord freed him. From the words of Romans chapter 3 that we read this morning, St. Paul's letter to the Romans. 
And when Luther finally understood these words, he said that it was as if paradise were open to him. And his whole life was changed. Because all of a sudden, it wasn't his earthly father who was speaking to him, but now his heavenly father. And uh, this morning, our heavenly father says to us that we are justified, declared not guilty by faith. That we are good enough. Good enough to be his children, the heirs of everlasting life, the eternal family of God. This is the gospel message, of course, that you come to hear every Sunday and to be reminded of God's great love for you so that you can use his words in your own self-talk about who you are and who God has made you. So as we listen to these words of St. Paul, who also wrestled uh, much in the same way. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, right? And he was sure that because Jewish blood coursed through his veins, that he was going to be able to make it to heaven on his own. And he worked very hard, and he was proud of keeping the Ten Commandments, so he thought, until the day that Jesus Christ appeared to him in person on the road to Damascus. And then all of his thinking about himself, his pride, vanished. And he really died, you might say, spiritually on that road. And this is exactly the same thing that happened to Martin Luther. It is the power of the Holy Spirit who works faith in our hearts to understand that God made us, God redeemed us, God sanctified us, God will glorify us forever in heaven. God wants us to know where we stand with him. He wants us to know the great love that he has for us. He wants us to be absolutely sure of who we are so that we can live in spiritual freedom and joy every day of our life until we see the Lord with our own eyes. We think about uh, wrestling in our lives and how our sinful natures have caused many problems and worries and fears and doubts and anxieties and how we have sought places in this world to find relief from these things. And maybe we've told ourselves, well, I just have to try harder. Be a better kid at home. Then maybe my parents will argue less. Or if I'm a standout in football, maybe my dad will drink less and come to my games be more a part of my life. Kind of fascinating. From a young time, uh, from uh, growing up in our home, that uh, we learn to begin to compensate and try to justify things by our own behavior in our lives. God speaks to us, however, and lets us know that uh, through the law, we are not good enough. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. So that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. But now, our righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known. So as we think about these uh, first verses that Paul uh, wrote... Uh, This is a preaching of the law, and it's kind of fascinating. Oftentimes, people look at God only through the law, and if that's how they look at God through the law, then they're always going to be living with that picture, that thought, that idea that I'm not good enough because the law condemns me. We look back into our lives and have seen the times that we have not kept God's word or commands. We have not listened to his advice and his wisdom, even though we knew it was the best thing to do. And how we can become slaves to sin. St. Paul said, the good that I would, I do not. The evil that I would not, that I do. What a wretched man I am. Paul knew what it was to be a slave to sin. And so we too, and Luther also. But this is not the only message that God has communicated to us in Holy Scripture. The law addresses our sinful nature. 
And according to our sinful nature, yes, we are not good enough. We cannot measure up to this holy, almighty God of the universe who made us and created us. We cannot keep his words and his commandments. All of us have failed. We're all in the same boat, right? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. As we uh, think about those words and their impact, we understand. And we believe that they are true. But God does not stop with the law. And this is uh, why we are here. If God had just stopped with the law, then it would be up to us, right? To justify ourselves, to earn our way to heaven. And we would be working on that throughout our life. Trusting in ourselves. It is through the gospel that God really reveals the heart of the Almighty and the great love that he has for every human being, for time and for eternity. And these are the words that Luther studied as he was a monk. He had access to the Bible. The common person could not afford a Bible because um, many of them were handwritten. The printing press had been just invented in 1450 and uh, books were now becoming available. So it was the church who controlled the reading and the study of the word. Only the officials had the right to preach and communicate what the word was. And the church was hammering on the law and using the law to motivate people. For example, when John Tetzel uh, came to uh, uh, Wittenberg and was sharing indulgences, he would preach a sermon to the people. And one of the things that he would tell the people is, can't you hear the voices of your mother or your father who have died and are now in purgatory? You need to pay for those souls to spring them from purgatory. That was part of the message. The church continued to manipulate and control the minds of the people with ideas that were not scriptural or biblical at all. We cannot buy or earn our way into heaven or into God's presence. Luther stood up because he had learned the truth. And in 1521, when he was called to the Diet of Worms, and he was told by Charles V to recant everything he had written about the gospel, he said, no, here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. He was ready to put his life on the gospel, which he had discovered in Romans chapter 3. But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. We cannot look inside of ourselves for salvation. We have to look outside of ourselves. And this is the gospel announcement, the righteousness that God commands or demands of each and every one of us. He provides for us in his son, Jesus Christ. It was interesting. As long as Luther was wrestling with the law and saw himself only in light of the law, he said, Whenever he came on this word uh, righteousness, he would become upset and angry because he knew he couldn't live up to God's holy expectations. In fact, he said he came to hate the name of Jesus Christ because he knew that he would be condemned to hell because of his sin. How patient God was with this man. And it was the Holy Spirit who helped him see that this righteousness that God demanded, he provides in the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary's cross for you and for me. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, past, present, and future. The blood of Jesus Christ is what has opened the doors of paradise for you and for me. The sacrifice that he made, the sinless son of God, he was, he is really the only human being uh, whose mouth was not shut up by the law. 
He is the only human being who could have gone directly to heaven. But no, he didn't. He stopped at Calvary and the cross for you and for me, thinking about us and our eternity, thinking about the family of God. And there he gave up his life as the payment for the sin of the entire world. And God provided the righteousness and the holiness that we need in his son. And now God declares you justified, not guilty of all sin. Holy, perfect, in the sense of his holy son. And so when God looks at you, he sees his son, Jesus Christ, through whom you were born again, and in whom God has placed your faith. What a fantastic Wonderful set of words to hear, isn't it? And to tell myself over and over again, we are all the children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. This God promises I will never leave you or forsake you. The same God promises I will make everything you experience in your life to work out for your eternal good. I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the God who is going to escort us home to heaven into his gracious, smiling presence. He's the one who is going to help us every step of the way, who's never going to let us down, lie to us, cheat us, anything. Only good is what he has promised through his son, Jesus Christ. God wants you to be telling yourself these things because this is the ultimate truth each and every day of your life when you get up and you look into the mirror, I am a child of God, an heir of everlasting life. This is what Luther was willing to give his life up for. This is why we call ourselves Lutheran Christians. It's because of the gospel. It's because of Jesus Christ. It's because of his love and the certainty of salvation that we have in him. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. God is a holy God and so he had to punish sin. And he determined to punish his son for the sin of the world and send him to hell in our place. And when Jesus cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was experiencing the punishment that you and I deserved. We will never speak those words. We will never know what Jesus went through so that we could spend eternity with him in heaven. What a blessing to know. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law? No. But on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Justified by grace. God declares you good enough through his son Jesus Christ. And it's my prayer that that message will help you each and every day of your life and fill your heart with joy and peace and confidence as you now get to communicate this good news to others by your attitude, by your words and your actions as members of the eternal family of God. How blessed we are. And may the Lord bless you this Reformation Day. Amen.